Her, Louis Levine here, is uh, with us from the MTA board, along with Ed Aliphant, who's the new interim director of the MTA, and council member uh, Peter Westerholm is with us. I'd also like to recognize Ralph Schultz from the, uh, from the chamber. Well, thank you all for being here. Um, I've invited you here to discuss the future of the AMP project going forward and the future of mass transit in Nashville in general. As a city, we are at a critical moment. The decisions we make today related to meeting our city's infrastructure needs will shape our future in significant ways. How our economy and job market thrive, how people move around our city every day to get to work, to school, to doctor's appointments, and the like. Time Magazine's recent profile on Nashville painted a picture of a booming city with all the right ingredients for economic success, everything uh, but better schools, and I would add to that list better mass transit. These are the top two issues we still have to get right. The U.S. Census Bureau just released new population estimates for 2013 that show Nashville to be the seventh fastest growing large city in the country. Austin is number one, and we're just one place behind Denver. Our city and region are growing, and that's a good thing. But we have to recognize that as we grow, additional traffic congestion and longer commute times are going to be a reality all over the city. In the not-too-distant future, we will all be spending more time stuck in traffic, whether you drive or take a bus, getting to where you want to go will take longer. We have a choice. We can plan for this growth and the traffic that comes with it, or we can accept the consequences of doing nothing, knowing that either decision will have a very real impact on our citizens' lives. Solving this problem has been the motivation behind the AMP. The process that led us here today began five years ago with an update to the MTA Transit Master Plan a detailed study that involved community input from across the country to determine the types of transit investments most needed in Nashville. The 2009 master plan identified an opportunity to implement bus rapid transit service from Gallatin Road in East Nashville to Vanderbilt West End area, noting that the regular bus routes serving those two areas were generating a large number of transfers. The master plan also identified Vanderbilt West End as a high priority to implement a transit system with expanded capacity such as streetcar or dedicated bus lanes. The plan pointed out that connecting West Nashville to downtown with this type of transit service would serve the city's two largest employment areas. In short, this means the master plan recognized the need to put the city's first major mass transit project along our densest corridor, the logical place to start. These types of transit projects are expensive to implement, and so we knew from the outset that federal funding would be absolutely necessary in order to move forward. There are very specific planning protocols that must be followed in order to qualify for federal transit funds. So in 2011, MTA began an alternative analysis of the route, which at the time was called the East-West Connector. This analysis, in addition to being the first necessary step in the federal planning process, allowed us to identify the best transit solution for this specific corridor. While there are a number of ways the FTA evaluates proposed transit systems, overall they prefer projects that will generate the most transit riders for the least amount of money. They want a project that is cost effective and so do we which is why through the alternative analysis process, we selected bus rapid transit with dedicated lanes over other alternatives such as a streetcar. The following year, we began preliminary engineering and design, which gave us sufficient information to complete our application for federal funding and successfully got accepted into the FTA's project development process, which happened last fall. And throughout each of these steps, we held numerous public meetings to gather community input. Last year, the Metro Council voted overwhelmingly in support of a capital spending plan that provided us with $7.5 million to begin final engineering and design. Then we learned in early March, just about a month ago, that we were selected by the FTA and the U.S. Department of Transportation for funding in the President's proposed budget for this coming fiscal year in a highly competitive grant process. The FTA, with congressional approval, is ready to give us $75 million toward the cost of the AMP. It is the largest federal grant in the history of the city. 
And I have to say that the risk of losing these funds, of losing this opportunity, of setting our, and of setting our city back another decade in our quest to begin mass transit is enormous. My point in recounting the extensive work undertaken for this project to date is to remind everyone that we didn't arrive here in haste. We arrived here out of a deliberative process, an open process, and a process dictated by federal requirements and guidelines. That said, while we have learned a lot over the last five years about the type of transit solutions most likely to receive federal funding, we have also learned through more than 120 community meetings that just because the federal government likes your transit project, it doesn't mean all the neighbors necessarily will. There are a lot of people passionately in support of the AMP. There are a lot of people just as passionately opposed to it. Change is hard, and the type of transit project we have proposed is a big change. And some of the concerns that have been raised are very legitimate. I'll say that the engineering task of making this system function along a road built for cars, not for transit, is not an easy one. There are real engineering challenges for a BRT system when you're trying to insert it into an already congested corridor. My point is I want the neighbors in the Richland, West End, Woodmont areas, and everyone who has participated in the development of this project by giving us their questions and comments to know you've been hurt. And the planning and design of the project is far from over. Nothing is carved in stone. Our goal forward is twofold. We want a transit system that will work, that people will have the opportunity to choose over taking a car because it's fast, convenient, and reliable. We want a transit system that is as least disruptive as possible to the property owners, businesses, and neighbors who frequent the corridor the most. And so the challenge that we face is balancing these two goals, a system that works from a transit service perspective and from a neighborhood perspective. I've asked the AMP project team and engineers to give me some options for how we address concerns about the project that have been most commonly raised. There are a number of smaller issues throughout the route that the engineering design teams have been working to address, down to details like individual driveways and business delivery access points. But in terms of major concerns affecting large portions of the route, it's the areas around the interstate overpass downtown and on West End where the width of the interstate bridges makes it difficult to incorporate dedicated bus lanes. And the stretch of route from Interstate 440 out to St. Thomas where the neighborhood concerns about lane loss and left turn access have been most vocal. Today, I'm releasing a memo that the project team prepared for me that outlines how we work toward those solutions for those two significant issues. The good news is that our engineering team is at a perfect place in the project design and development to incorporate revisions. In fact, as they explain, the FTA ex expects these types of revisions to occur during the environmental review process that is actually taking place right now. That process includes things like community and neighborhood impacts. And it's typical for a transit project, such as the AMP, to be modified as a result of community concerns. So I'm announcing today that based on the project team's advice and my own desire to create an environment of compromise and collaboration, I am directing the AMP project team to refocus the design for the westernmost portion of the AMP from I-440 out to St. Thomas uh, to function as a bus rapid transit without dedicated travel lanes. Similar to the BRT light that we currently have operating very successfully on Gallatin Road and Murfreesboro Road. I am also asking the project team to examine running the AMP in mixed traffic from the I-40 overpass downtown to the Broadway West End split. As you'll read in the memo, there are a lot of considerations in changing the AMP's design in this way. The team will need to recalculate travel times, for example, things, uh, uh, things like how efficient and predictable the bus schedule will remain with this change have to be figured out. We have to build a project that the FTA can have confidence in being successful in order to remain in the pipeline for federal funds. And we have to build a project that will improve people's ability to travel along this corridor enough so that they will want to ride it. 
As I said, transit that's fast, convenient, and reliable. But if we can accomplish those goals with a BRT system less dependent on dedicated travel lanes than what has been proposed to date, then that's what we should do. And that's what we will do. Studying these changes to the AMP will be, will be a months long process. Our project team was aiming to have updated design plans by the fall. In addition to changing what they are working on, I am asking our project team to change how they go about their work as well. I want to build a transit project that works for the FTA, but most importantly, that works for Nashville especially the people who live or work nearby. And in order to do that, I believe more community leaders along the corridor need greater involvement in the planning process. So today I'm announcing the formation of a Citizens Advisory Committee for the AMP. The committee will be a vehicle for the project team to share information about the AMP design and solicit feedback, meaning it will facilitate a two-way conversation with the community most greatly impacted by the project. In addition to the community input meetings we have been holding throughout the planning process over the last five years and that we will continue to hold, this Citizens Advisory Committee will meet on a more frequent basis with the project team to have input on design and service options. I will ask our local and state representatives along the route to help me select the committee members and to make sure that, group re that groups represent the geographic and stakeholder diversity along the corridor. We will invite people to participate on the committee regardless of whether they are seen as supportive of the AMP or not. People who have been opposed to this project can contribute to this process in a positive way. Emotions have run high as the conversation about the AMP has heated up. People feel very passionately on both sides about what they do or don't want this project to be. So let me be clear. Creating a successful mass transit system is not an exercise of politics. It takes engineering and expertise to create a transit line that will work. And so it is the engineers who are guiding the design of this project from both Metro and TDOT. I can't dictate the results. Other people can't dictate the results. The outcome will be based on what works within the parameters set by the FTA. My hope is that we can come together to find a real solution to a real problem. We should be about finding the best option that will benefit the most people, and this solution will be based on sound engineering and facts. I would ask those who are invited to serve on the Citizens Advisory Committee and everyone who chooses to remain engaged in this project, no matter where they stand today, to keep an open mind as we begin this new approach. Going back to my days as a trial attorney, the instructions a judge would give to a jury uh, before going into deliberations is an appropriate comparison for the task I'm asking the advisory committee to undertake. To paraphrase, to consult with one another, to deliberate, do not hesitate to re-examine your own views and change your opinion if convinced it is erroneous but do not surrender your honest conviction as to the weight or effect of the evidence solely because of the opinion of others. We can change how we go about this project, but we can't change our city's need for mass transit. We need it today, and we will need it even more in five years and 10 years. Our current bus system won't solve the traffic problems coming our way, and one project on one corridor is not gonna be enough. We need the AMP so we can show that transit works and so we can implement similar transit lines all over our county and our region. This is an opportunity. We've never come so far in making mass transit a reality for Nashville and we can't turn our backs on it. I think all of us standing here today and all of us responsible for leading the city, including the Metro Council, can agree that we want Nashville to be the best city possible. We are enjoying tremendous success and we want that success to continue. And it is our very nature as Nashvillians to come together in a civil, responsible way to work in partnership, to work with each other instead of against each other, to achieve our common desire for Nashville to continue to be a thriving, prosperous city now and for generations to come. 
That is what I hope uh, we can accomplish in the months and days ahead. And I'd be happy to answer a few questions from the media. Yep. Will this recalibration affect the construction timeline? I don't know. I mean, one of the things when I'm asked about a timeline is this is different than any other project the city's undertaken and sort of underscores the complexity of transit. Um, we can stay on the schedule that we're on in terms of having the environmental work done and completed by the end of this year. Um, and, in, and in theory, and I think it's, it's, it's a probability that we could be ready to begin the process in, um, in terms of construction in 2015. But there are lots of moving pieces in this. As, as we've all learned over the course of the last year, you have a local piece, you have a state piece, and you have a federal piece. And getting everybody uh, on the same page at the same time is, is work. Yes? Any, any chance you think these changes affect the federal funding piece of this or kind of those guidelines? Um, I do not. We've been in touch with the FDA. Um, we talk to them regularly, and we've actually talked to them about this. Uh, they're aware of our plan. And they told us um, that um, it is very common for projects um, to go through this sort of discussion. And it is encouraged by the FDA uh, for us to do what we're doing. So um, this is not set off alarm bells at the FDA. Were you worried that uh, you were on track to lose the battle at the, the General Assembly? I mean, the House hasn't even... Well, I, I think, I mean, clearly I'm aware of what's happening um, up on the, on the Hill, and I think that that is certainly a reality that um, is a consideration of mine. But I would underscore the fact that what we're trying to do is encourage a feeling of collaboration and compromise to work as Nashvilleians always do, is to work together to find real answers and real solutions. Um, and, and that's why we're doing this. I understand um, Lee Beeman has agreed to be on the panel. Is that correct? I haven't spoken directly with, uh, with Lee, um, but uh, others have talked to Mr. Beeman, and it's my understanding that um, he is interested in serving, but that's just what I've heard at this point. But uh, we'll certainly be reaching out to him, and he would certainly be welcome to attend. The, um, of course, the property he owns is right in that area of the I-40 bridge, and I think he would be able to make a valuable uh, contribution. Anything else? Yes, exactly what area you plan on? There's two, well, there's two areas that we've asked this group to look at. They can look at other areas, but the areas that, um, that are mentioned in the memo are the, the area from the interstate bridge, I-40, on Broadway West End, leading up to the Broadway West End split. And then the area, essentially 440 to St. Thomas, which would be um, the area that we requested that they look at. Yes. I think before the street, the dedicated lanes went for about 80 percent of the route. Do you know roughly what percentage they'll go now? No, I mean that is all to be determined. I mean, I, I think one of the, as, as I said in my remarks, this is not something that I should or can dictate what the results are. I mean, obviously, the federal government, in making a, an investment of $75 million, is interested in an efficient, effective, convenient system, and dedicated lanes are part of that. But, um, but th the discussion um, will go forward, and, the, and we'll get the recommendations, and we'll see what folks, what folks want. Thank you all for, your, for coming here and for your questions. I'll have handouts for the media. Thank you.